Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, digital projects here at the Library of Congress, um, and I it's going to be an overview of the Preservation Services Division, which is where I uh, work, and we have a lot of exciting projects. Um, as uh, George was so kind to say, I am a digital project specialist in the Preservation Services Division. Um, my pet project is uh, working on born digital data preservation, which is uh, removing the uh, or copying the bits and bytes off of old media, um, all the ones that he uh, listed as well as many more. Um, and he uh, underestimated how many um, we do. We have uh, hundreds of thousands of items, if not more. Um, and that turns into millions and billions of files, uh, petabytes of data that we're um, pulling off of those media and making available. And that's uh, key parts of history uh, that have, would otherwise be inaccessible because they're sitting on pieces of media that we can't use anymore. Um, my office also uh, works on large-scale digitization of books, newspapers, and microfilm. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. We do still microfilm some items, um, but we are switching completely to digital. Uh, we also work on collections care, binding, and boxing. Um, so because you have me and because my pet project is Born Digital Media, um, I'm going to talk about that uh, first. Um, so here you get an example of many of the objects that we are talking about, um, the large majority of which are optical discs. So you've got C CDs, DVDs, uh, Blu-rays, and other optical disc formats. Um, these can hold a small amount to a huge amount of data. Uh, and if you can think of uh, a textbook that you got that had a CD in the back, or you can think of all of the uh, music and um, media that was released on uh, optical disks. If you're thinking about all the times that you burned the contents of your computer onto a, a, a CD, you're thinking about all the different types of media that we get in our division. Um, we also have all kinds of flop floptical disks uh, like Zip, Easy Drive, and Jazz, among others. Um, these were kind of between uh, floppy disks and optical disks, um, so you have an actual disk inside a cartridge. Um, and each of these has uh, a need for its own individual type of drive to be able to work. We also have all sizes of floppy disks, not just five and a quarter and three and a half, although those are the most uh, common, but we also have eight inch, three inch, and other weirder formats. Um, these were very widely used from 1972 to 2000 and a little bit beyond, and um, they can be in all kinds of different formats. So we have all kinds of different ways to, uh, to access these and preserve the data on them. And then we also get hard drives of all different formats, um, including internal and external formats. So as I said, if you can think of a textbook that came with one of those pieces of media in the back, um, we get those too, as part of copyright deposit uh, or as part of uh, a collections acquisition that comes into the library. Um, you'll see we get boxes full of CDs, we get uh, individual floppy, uh, not floppy, uh, thumb drives, um, which we then have to uh, keep in these nice notebooks um, to make sure that they don't get lost. Uh, we have car shelves and shelves of books that we process through um, one, in one cartload at a time. Um, and this has all the different types of collections that the library owns. So uh, you've got copyright deposits, so every type of uh, knowledge under the sun. You've got technical reports and standards, conference proceedings, and uh, ge geographical data, among others. So the sorts of collections that are on these types of items, we've got the machine readable collection, which has about 55,000 items that we're working on uh, just one at a time. Um, a large project from the geography and maps division, uh, which is estimated to be about 75,000 items. Uh, we've got 7,000 video games uh, in the motion picture broadcasting and recording sound division. Uh, we also have 5,000 items in the technical reports section. So you're talking about lots of scale. Uh, you're talking about not just working one at a time, but working uh, on workflows that are going to go on for years. And then we have special collections. If you're thinking about uh, so-and-so's collection, the papers of Stephen Sondheim, the papers of Judge Elena Kagan, um, if you're thinking of all these different people's individual collections, you're also thinking about how they interacted with computers, how they interacted with data, and then how that data gets to the Library of Congress as part of their collections. So often we will get these boxes of haphazard uh, sets of media, and we will work through those one collection at a time. Uh, all of the different special collections in the library are represented in those workflows. 
We have also conducted uh, several external media surveys to try to make sure that we know how much uh, data is in the library, how many pieces of media. Um, we also want to know where those exist, what formats they are in, um, and how we are going to work through those. So our latest one uh, was started in 2020 and it got interrupted by the pandemic, but we will be continuing on and making sure that we have a good handle of everything that's in the library. So our workflow here is bit level preservation. Uh, we are making a copy of the data and we're keeping it safe in our long-term repository. Um, we use a bunch of tools that uh, are a confluence of three different disciplines. Uh, a lot of the tools that we used were uh, developed for law enforcement or criminal investigations uh, because they have a lot of the same goals as we do. We want to make sure that the data is copied over safely, that it didn't change in transit, and that it hasn't changed over time. Um, this is important in law enforcement because uh, that's how the evidence is maintained throughout the years. Um, archivists, are, like me, are also working uh, to make sure that cultural heritage uh, is preserved into perpetuity. And then a lot of the tools that I use were developed uh, because of gamers, um, video gamers, uh, or enthusiasts who are trying to emulate old games, um, make sure that, uh, that that data hasn't changed over time. Um, and since video games have been released on all different types of media, uh, they are interested in preserving all different types of media. So sometimes they have some tools that uh, law enforcement wasn't interested in developing. So we're trying to make a copy. We're trying to make sure that it's described, that, it's, uh, that we verify that it hasn't changed over time. Um, and our ultimate goal is hardware independence. We do not want to maintain a five and a quarter inch floppy drive in the reading rooms uh, for the rest of our the Library of Congress's days. So we need to make sure that that um, bit level copy of the media is uh, going to be ac accessible to our researchers um, in the reading rooms without needing one of those drives. So we have a bunch of tools that help make this happen. Um, this is a, an example of one of our workstations um, in my division. Uh, we have specialized forensic uh, computers that are developed to help uh, transfer all this data off of the media and keep it safe. We have optical disc robotic loaders, which load a stack of 100 CDs at a time and feed them through, making disc images of each, and then spit them out the front. Um, so this helps to automate some of our workflows. As I said, we're working through hundreds of thousands of items, and so we need to make sure that uh, we can work through those efficiently. As I said, we have forensic workstations. Um, these have uh, write blocking uh, bays in the front to make sure that the data isn't going to accidentally be overwritten. We wouldn't want to accidentally overwrite, uh, I'll bring Stephen Sondheim up again, uh, one of his floppy disks that he made or a hard drive. Um, we want to make sure that the data is only flowing to our computers and not anything back the other way. We also have a hot swap bays in the front, um, which makes it easy to uh, to, put in, to plug in a hard drive and plug and play, uh, just like we had plugged in a CD or uh, an external hard drive, um, you could do that for an internal hard drive as well. Um, make it really easy to swap things back and forth. Um, we have old computers that I've taken apart and I've called them Frankenstations, um, and we're using those mostly for parts, um, but if you'll notice the five and a quarter inch floppy drive here in the front, that's what I want and uh, that's what I'm using it for. Um, so I'm making sure that it's powered and that I can access the data. We've got floppy disk controllers, which help to translate these uh, old computer parts to a modern operating system to make sure that we can get that data. Uh, we also have um, devices which read floppy disks at the magnetic flux level, which means that it's making an image of the magnetic fluctuations on that disk. Uh, so we don't even care what format the disk is in. We um, just are capturing those magnetic uh, fluctuations, and then we interpret those later into a formatted disk and are able to uh, acquire the files afterwards. And this has helped us recover floppy disks that are uh, in a weird format that we've never seen before, some that were damaged, including one that had bar been partially melted. We were able to recover some files off of that. So we've got a lot of specialized equipment that can help us out. Um, and then I maintain a boneyard of old computers to help us uh, access those items and a bunch of specialized uh, cables and dongles and pieces of hardware that will help me out. And our typical preservation, preservation package, though this varies from project to project, um, is making a disk image, uh, which is a bit-for-bit -bit copy of the original media. We extract the files, and then we have a scan of the original media item so that we know what it looks like. Um, we put this into the baggage structure, which uh, is a special uh, structure that was made, uh, created by the Library of Congress in order to 
um, enable long-term preservation. Uh, it basically keeps a manifest of every file that's in the package as well as its hash value so that we know that the uh, item has not changed, each of the files has not changed over time and that none of the files have gotten lost along the way. It includes human readable met metadata which accompanies the files so that everybody knows what they're looking at. So we have a wonderful uh, access platform called Stacks, which is available if you're in the library buildings or if you're in the library's IP range. Um, and you'll see here examples of uh, some of this media that we've processed in our Stacks uh, system. And so you can search these just like you would search the library, the library catalog, um, and then you can access the data that's in there as well. Um, so if you clicked on one of these, you would see uh, I picked one with a very long title. Um, you'll see the preservation package items down below, uh, including the extracted files, the ISO disk image, and um, the ThumbsDB, which um, is part of the scan of the item. Um, and if you click on that, you can browse through the files and you can access those. If you clicked on a file that uh, was, say, a, uh, an Excel file, then the system would render it automatically so that you can actually read it and use it and uh, interacts with it like you would uh, opening a book. This is a very powerful system that we have available here on the, on the Library of Congress um, campus. So the other thing that my office works on is digitization at scale. Uh, we have contracts that are digitizing books and newspapers and are soon going to be digitizing microfilm um, at scale. So our oldest project is the Brittle Books uh, Digitization Project, which is uh, primarily concerned with preserving the books that are at risk of preservation problems, um, such as disintegration, decay, uh, acidic paper, um, fragile paper pages that are falling to pieces. Um, sometimes they have water damage and sometimes the binding has fallen apart. So we're digitizing those and then putting the original object in a nice box and putting that into long-term storage uh, in our temperature-controlled uh, high-capacity storage bays. Um, we also have in-house digitization uh, capabilities. Uh, this pictured here is a, a BC100 uh, book scanner, which is a very uh, high-resolution um, book scanner that our technicians use um, and we are creating uh, those items uh, kind of on a, in a boutique sort of um, situation uh, whenever we have special requests or things that need to be digitized very quickly. Um, we'll do those ourselves in a house. But we also have vendor contracts which are digitizing thousands of books per year, um, which would be mil millions of pages. And our division does quality assurance and makes sure that those files make it online. So we've got two ways of accessing those books. Uh, first is Stacks, um, which similar to the Born Digital data, uh, if you're in the Library of Con Congress campus, then um, you can access it through Stacks and read through the books in a PDF. Um, if you're anywhere in the world uh, and the items are out of copyright, then you can uh, access them through the Library of Congress website. Um, so the item on the right, uh, the brownies and other stories, that's an item that has fallen out of copyright and therefore uh, we have made it available to everybody in the whole world. So if you go on the Library of Congress and you search the catalog, you can find this item. Uh, we also have a foreign, digital, foreign newspaper digitization program. Um, we've got millions of uh, pages of items that we're digitizing per year, uh, hundreds of thousands of issues from all over the world. Uh, these are also accessible through Stacks. If you go uh, to that website while you're on the Library of Camp Congress campus, um, you can browse through these by title and then by date. Um, and you can browse all the individual issues and read through them as a PDF. So these are additional links that will help you uh, access all of this exciting stuff that we're digitizing at the Preservation Services Division. Uh, so the first link is for selected digital books, which will get you to uh, all of the items that are available on the Library of Congress website to anybody in the world. Um, if you're outside of the Library of Congress campus and you want to browse through what we have available digitally, you can look th at that place right there. If you're sitting in one of our beautiful buildings, uh, you can access uh, even more through Stacks, uh, which is at stacks.loc.gov. I wanted to highlight last year's preservation uh, presentation at the National Book Festival, which is called The Visible Book, A Look Inside at Book Construction, Historic to Modern. And this is talking about conservation and book construction uh, for old and rare manuscripts that are at the Library of Congress. 
And in addition, uh, if you are interested in visiting one of our buildings and obtaining a reader card, uh, there is a wonderful website that will teach you how to do that. It's very easy and it's free. And um, it's very exciting to have your own Library of Congress research card. Um, and it gets you access to all kinds of things, uh, including stacks and including research in our collections. So please do that. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, we have, mic we have microphones available. Thank you. Hi, thanks for that, that was really interesting. So when you're digitizing uh, all this information, you're storing it, what's the security like? Like where do you store it? How do you ensure that people aren't gonna hack in and start, I don't know, doing something terrible with it? Sure, that's a great question. We do wanna make sure that all of our data is safe. Um, we are the home of the Copyright Office, so we wanna make sure that all of the things that we're digitizing that are within copyright are safe. Um, and that they're only accessible under the limited circumstances that we feel is, uh, is fair use. So um, we have different storage systems at the library. Uh, if an item is out of copyright and it's available to be ac accessible um, to the whole world, then we'll put it in uh, one project, which uh, puts it in one different, one storage system, um, which allows it to go to the Library of Congress website and go through that presentation mode. Um, if it is under copyright, uh, then the master files go to uh, our long-term preservation storage system, and then the access copy, which is the PDF, goes to what's called restricted storage, and that's only available within the Library of Congress IP range. So um, we've got different ways behind the scenes of making sure that things are routed to the correct areas. Um, and then uh, outside of that, are, we have a wonderful um, officer of the CIO, uh, office of the CIO, and uh, their uh, IT professionals make sure that we've got all the uh, network security and everything that we need to make sure that everything's safe. Um, and I feel like we do a wonderful job of keeping things safe, uh, and sometimes, um, sometimes too safe. Sometimes it's a little difficult to get some of the items uh, to, the right, to the readers to make sure that they can uh, research what they want to, um, which is why a system like Stacks is wonderful, because um, it is making that easier for everybody. Hey, hi. Um, I was, I was just wondering. I know you're saying you're digitizing it, but what format are you putting it on? Is you're digitizing because I'm thinking in 20 years there's going to be something even greater. You know, maybe a hologram coming out of a book or something. Who knows? <laughs> um, but like, are you keeping like phys I know you're keeping the the originals archived, but are, are you keeping like if I had a book and you just an old book and it's being retyped, are you just keeping a physical copy of that as well as digital in case something goes wrong? Because, you know, we get attacks all the time, you know, and you just don't want to lose anything. Sure. Um, yeah, and I do want to emphasize that the physical object is safe. Um, it is kept in pristine preservation conditions. It's in a nice sturdy box um, so that it's very safe and sturdy. Um, our high capacity storage bays are uh, just top of the line uh, preservation storage. Um, it's fantastic. The scans themselves um, are to the highest quality of digitization that is a, available right now, um, 600 DPI. Uh, the Most of our books right now, uh, most of our digitization projects right now are uh, JP, JPEG 2000 master um, with uh, GIF derivative and, sorry, I know that's divisive, GIF <laughs> derivative and, uh, um, and also <laughs> a PDF. Um, we've got, we make sure that we've got uh, proper uh, preservation and descriptive uh, XML files as sidecars. Um, we've got, uh, OCR to make sure that everything's searchable, um, optical character recognition to make sure that everything's uh, searchable uh, word for word. Um, and those are the highest standards that exist right now. Um, our digitization also uh, exists to the FAGI three star standard, um, which is, a, there's only four star levels. Um, so we're uh, holding our vendors accountable to um, a very, very high standard to make sure that uh, we're getting the best possible digitization available right now. Right. Um, we have in the past uh, digitized things to lower standards and we have converted those to these newer standards now. Um, and I think we're very confident that the stuff that we are digitizing right now is going to be a very high quality uh, copy for everybody into perpetuity. As far as 
holograms are concerned. <laughs> um, I hope not. Uh, they're a very That'd hard thing to, digitize, uh, to, to preserve. Um, <laughs> it's a very complex file. But um, I think that uh, as we come across more, uh, more ability to digitize things to a higher standard without compromising on um, our ability to preserve it long term, because that balance always has to be there, we want to make sure that it is available long term. Um, so as those change in the future, we will continue to continually reassess uh, what we're digitizing things to and make sure that we're always maintaining those higher standards. Yeah, it'd probably be easier going from what you're doing now to the next new thing versus what you have to deal with now. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, this young lady was was coming up, and then. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, so I'm a library science student at the University of Maryland who's yeah. really interested in doing digital preservation, and I wanted to ask, what do you think are the most important skills for somebody who wants to do your kind of work uh, to learn? Um, having a good ability, uh, having a good knowledge of computers is very uh, uh, important, and that means um, knowing how to interact with the computer system um, in, a, in a more advanced way than just general office skills, I guess. Um, half of my job, because I'm working in this kind of weird space, um, half of my job is a screwdriver and putting and taking things, old things apart, putting them back together in new ways. But then the other half of my job is coding mm -hmm. um, and making sure that I'm manipulating files in a way um, that is scalable. Um, so co uh, having a familiarity with uh, like Python, um, shell scripting, things like that would be very important. Um, understanding file types, understanding, um, yeah, just how everything goes together mm -hmm. uh, is very helpful. And then getting experience under your belt and just, um, I would say, uh, look at the uh, internships and fellowships that are available at the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. There is a, an office that manages all of those, including the junior fellow program, which is very, very uh, exciting and important. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. This gentleman over here and then mm -hmm. over here. Sure. Uh, do you use the commercial cloud for storing things? And also, how do you deal with, uh, if you want to make sure, in case something really huge disaster happens in this city even or something, how do you handle that? OK. Uh, I believe our new uh, iteration of our repository system is going to be cloud-based. Um, right now, it's not. But we do have uh, redundancy as far as where our data is uh, copied. Um, I'm not even allowed to know where all the repositories are, um, but I know that they are geographically diverse. Uh, and then lots of copies make stuff safe, uh, so we're making sure that there is a copy of all of our data in each of those spaces, um, and then we're making sure that, uh, that it's following all of those um, redundancy and preservation uh, protocols that are, you know, all over the the entire IT world. Um, we have a, a conference every year uh, called, the, it has to do with repository development. Um, and the Library of Congress is leading that because um, it is so important to us to make sure that our data is safe. So I think, uh, I think we're safe. I hope nothing happens to DC because I live and work here. Um, <laughs> but I think that if that did happen, uh, then the data would be safe. Thank you for asking. Hi. Um, what is your decision process for choosing which books to archive or, you know, to scan and put into archive? Sure. Um, my division does not make these decisions. Uh, we follow the recommendations of the uh, collecting divisions. Um, but we do ha have an emphasis because uh, we work and live in the preservation directorate. We're making sure that the things that are at highest risk, um, so the things that are literally falling apart, um, are the first things that we're working on. Um, their Library of Congress has millions of books, mm -hmm. and we are working through those um, as fast as we can uh, to make sure that uh, we have a digital copy, that that is accessible widely, um, that we're preserving the data in the original uh, object, and that we are uh, making all of that available. So thank you. Thank you. Hello. 
how far, how much, what percentage are actually digitized? What percentage are digitized? digitized? What percentage are digitized? And how fast are you digitizing the rest? So right now, I believe that the goal for the newspaper, the foreign newspapers is possibly 100%. Um, I think because we, I think there was a decision made that all of that would be much better accessible in stacks. Um, it's just so much better to, uh, to search, to browse, um, to f access all of that huge amount of data. Um, it's better if it's all digitized. Um, books, I'm not sure. I, I don't have an answer to that question, unfortunately. Um, for the digital media, 100%, because uh, we want to achieve that hardware independence to make sure that we don't have to maintain even a CD drive uh, in the reading rooms because eventually those are going to be obsolete as well. Um, they're already kind of going that way. So um, it's, again, much more uh, ideal to have all of that available in stacks or some other similar access uh, service to make sure that um, it's accessible to everybody. All right. Thank you so much.